Hi, we continue in Luke 14 today after what one scholar called the four course meal that goes from 14, one to 24 with Jesus in the house of the Pharisee, giving them instructions uh, or warnings perhaps about their seating places and their social relationships at meals. And much of the thrust of that section was, if you don't plan ahead to understand the consequences of your choices, you are likely to be dishonored or even publicly shamed. So what we see now as Jesus shifts audiences, as you can see on the left side of the screen, starting in verse 25, now large crowds were traveling with him and he turned and said to them uh, that he's speaking to the crowds. But presumably these crowds have heard or seen what saw before, because certainly what follows in the rest of chapter 14 here from verse 25 through 35 through another chapter could easily be spoken to the people inside the Pharisee's house. Perhaps the point is that they're lost, that they're not going to turn around. They are committed to not following Jesus and the crowd perhaps may still be open to the possibility of following Jesus. And we have to note as we do as we've been looking out through this chapter that, that although the crowd could include all kinds of people historically, for Luke the crowd in the sense of his audience are the young adult Romans who have been uh, being formed in their ordinary life in Paideia, the educational propagandistic system that would shape them to take their place within the Roman Empire that they've been born and shaped for. Um, so what Jesus is calling them to do here is reject that completely. And as we'll see, that starts with rejecting the hardest thing of all, your own immediate family. And in the Roman world, the father, the pater familia, had almost 100% unchallenged power. So we'll have to look a little bit more at how that is even a harsher sounding thing than it would sound to most of us in an individualistic Western uh, society where people are asked, what do you want to do when you grow up? And quote unquote, good parents allow their children to do whatever they want rather than forcing them into a position as certainly a Roman father would expect, especially from his sons. So to enter into this passage, let's situate ourselves as we've been doing here on the right side. You can see the journey to Jerusalem chiasm that we've been following. And now we're in this section here, parallel to the fig tree parable that we saw on the other side of the chiasm. And then it will continue into the three stories of lost things right after this. Uh, our key words have been going really section by section throughout the chapter. And as you can see here, the, in the red, the cannot be my disciple is key. And the underlining here is not about key words. The underlining is to show connections with, with the, the key word phrase there. And we'll see some more of that as we go. Um, the sequences we've been looking at, we saw in chapter 13, the beginning of this unit, the question was around the fig tree and the, and the bent over woman about the future of Jerusalem and Israel. But now in chapter 14, the question is uh, on, the focus is on Ro Luke's Roman uh, elite audience. And so we saw how the challenges when they throw great suppers, plainly ordinary people and poor people aren't throwing great suppers and inviting rich people uh, in and don't even have to face the question of inviting their rich friends and neighbors, etc. So this is plainly being addressed to the elite, the, the rich people, and as we'll see in our uh, ending passage here, people who can plan to build towers or people like kings who can expect to go into battle. And this is all about preparing people to understand the consequences of choosing Jesus in the face of all the pressures they would have to conform to the Roman Empire. Um, our little section here, I, I framed it as a chiasm. It's not a traditional chiasm where words are echoed from one place to another. It's more a thematic chiasm. It really isn't verbally parallel much at all, other than uh, the B parts about cannot be my disciple. So um, whether you want to consider this quote unquote a real chiasm is up to you. I don't want to engage in scholarly arguments around that. But hopefully whether you call it a chiasm or not isn't the point. It shows how the passage is shaped. So it begins with the narrator's introduction that Jesus is turning and speaking to the crowd and it ends with Jesus' own words, let anyone with ears to hear listen. So it's framing what Jesus has to say. And the first part here in the B section are two requirements of discipleship, hating family, and of course we're going to look in detail about what that might mean, and carrying the cross. And on the other side, uh, saying goodbye, literally saying goodbye to possessions and uh, somehow being like salt, even though it doesn't say that exactly. The C sections here are examples of bad planning. The C one is about building a tower, and the D one about going out to wage war. And at the center is what I understand to be the heart of this whole thing. This fellow began to build and was not able to finish, and fellow is a derogatory word there. In other words, people will be made fun of and ridiculed and ashamed and dishonored uh, if they 
are going to start following Jesus and then realize the cost is more than I thought and I can't do it and then people ridicule them for it. So uh, either don't do it or do it and know you are going to do it all the way through. And that will be the message in Acts of the Apostles as well, especially in the story of Ananias and Sapphira that we'll see in Acts 5 where Peter says to him, "Was not were not your possessions your own and nobody made you do this, so why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And that's really important for understanding Luke's larger picture. It's not like, as some Christians might understand, that Jesus expects everybody has to be a quote-unquote Christian or they're going to hell. That whole notion, both the being a Christian and going to hell, are completely foreign to Luke uh, and really to the Bible altogether. This is not about Christianity. It's about listening to the good news of Jesus about what the God of Israel has wanted all along. And you can either be part of this movement or not. And if you're not, the consequences will simply come to you. There don't have to be threats uh, that you're going to hell or some afterlife threats. The consequences will be that your life will be full of the very kind of anxiety and fear and other negative experiences that Jesus is trying to liberate people from, as we saw with the bent over woman as a liberation. Um, so uh, it has nothing to do um, with threats or anything. It simply has to do with if you're going to choose to do this, then be aware in advance of what's going on. So I'll put our keywords back up. And uh, I had imagined as I was finishing the last video that we would just cruise right through the rest of the chapter in this video. But as I was preparing for it, I think it's going to be more prudent to slow it down a little bit and take it in two chunks. So we'll see the first half today and the second half in the next video. So going to our verse on the left side. So now large crowds were traveling. Um, and the now is not in Greek, but it's highlighting that the crowds are with him. Um, Suen Portianto literally traveling with them. Uh, as Marshall notes, the theme of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem is kept before the reader by the use of um, omenai. Uh, so we have that word there, highlighting traveling with them. And he turned and said to them, um, and this is a very specific word for turning. Um, we'll see it a number of times uh, later, a couple times later, and we've seen it earlier. Um, and it suggests the consequences of including dishonored persons from the preceding passage, as, we'll, as I was just saying. So he turned to them, and so nobody is asking him a question. He's not interrupting something that somebody else had to say. Somewhere along the way, he's just decided the time has come to tell them this. Um, so. Um, we see the first two verses here about renouncing a family. Um, and as Rorba and Neri, who we've been looking at in this chapter because they focus on the anthropological elements, the honor, shame, and other elements of this, they note here, the price of the decision made in the preceding parable to give up allegiance with one's peers in joining the Christian community. And that's all fine other than that Christian community is anachronistic in this situation. So let's listen very carefully what Jesus has to say, because this is one of those passages that people either don't understand and just shake their head or just say, I can't do that or Jesus can't mean that. Uh, but he absolutely does mean it. So let's see what's going on here. So whoever comes to me, Urkatai, uh, first step, as Marshall notes, to be complimented by after, um, and we'll see in verse 27 here. Um, although we don't see the after in the English there, it's covered up. So whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. On the surface of those words is absolutely unambiguous, other than the question of what the word hate means. And of course, that's the whole issue here. So the word hate is um, from the Greek missio. And um, here are the uses of it in Luke. And I've highlighted the difference, um, the contrast here, as you can see. I haven't color coded them, but you can see some of them involve people hating, quote, you, which is to say disciples. But this one involves you affirmatively hating. So uh, let's look at these and we, maybe we can get a sense of it from, from the usage, but then I can add something we know from bigger context. So we heard way back here in Zechariah's um, uh, little song, we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So that experience of being hated as an Israelite, and there's certainly nothing surprising or new about that, and being saved from those people. And as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Plain, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the human one. And notice that defaming you here is exactly what's going to be at issue here of saying bad things publicly about you. Notice what's in common with these, hating you, excluding you, reviling you, which is to say you're not one of us. We reject you. We exclude you and we reject you. But love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. 
So in the face, this is just five verses later. So in the face of people's rejection of you, do good to them anyway. And Paul notes the same thing about uh, doing good uh, to your enemies. Uh, so that's certainly the message of Jesus when people hate you. Uh, let's skip over our immediate one and we'll come back to the in a minute. So in chapter 16, we'll see after a little story, no slave can serve two masters. A slave will either hate the one and love the other or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth or as in the traditional God and mammon, um, a understood as a local God, not of the Romans, uh, who represented wealth. So it's just translated as wealth here. And this is also part of the point. One has to make a choice between one path and the other. Um, we see down in 1914, within a little story Jesus is telling as he's about to arrive in Jerusalem, a thinly veiled parable about how Herod got his power by going back to Rome and getting it from the Romans. The citizens of his country, which is to say the Judahites, hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to rule over us. Uh, and then we get to the one at the end here near the apocalyptic discourse, you will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish, and as we'll see in a moment, um, by your hupomene, which is to say your faithful resistance, you will save your life. We'll see how that comes up around another theme that we saw. So when we, with that framework, we see our passage here. Notice of seven of them. This is the fourth, right in the center. Don't know if Luke intended that. In the Hebrew Bible, that's often the case that a word is used a, a number of seven or multiple of seven times, but I can't um, dig into Luke's intention to know whether that's coincidental or not. But if it's not, it's interesting that this one's at the center. So whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself. Notice this is plainly addressed to men because it doesn't say husband. So wife specifically here. So it's addressed to the men in the audience. Uh, and that's not too surprising under the circumstances. Let's look at some of the details. So the question of hating father, we've seen this twice before, uh, at least in its basic theme. Let's look at it at the very beginning of the journey to Jerusalem. When somebody came up to him and said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus' response was, let the dead bury their own dead as for you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And as we saw back then, the issue isn't just literally burying your father, like my father's dead and the body is there and I just had to take care of this task. What it almost certainly means is my father is old, so let me stay with my father, uh, following perhaps the commandment to honor your father and mother from the Hebrew Bible, and stay with them, stay with them till the end. Uh, and yet what she's suggesting here is anybody who's not following in Jesus' way, who's not trying to live the way Jesus is living, whether they claim Jesus or not, as we've seen, um, is already dead in a sense, already not fully living their life. Um, so we saw that one there. Um, and then we saw this one not long ago at the end of chapter 12. From now on, five and one household will be divided, three against two and two against three divided father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against his mother -in -law, her mother-in-law. Notice the detail highlighting that there. So the family will certainly be divided. Let's look at a couple more details and then we'll focus on the word hate. So wife here, um, ten gunaika here, um, only, only used here, um, although we'll see one other example of it. Uh, let's, in fact, let's look at it here in 1829 here. So he said to them, truly I tell you, there is no one who is, this is after the story, by the way, of the rich man who walks away sad, and then Peter asks, what about us? There is no one who has left house, or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not get, get back very much more in this age, and in the age to come eternal life. I'll, I'll note now, although we're not on chapter 18 yet, of course, neither of these are about the afterlife. In this age plainly is in this very life, and that's played out in Acts of the Apostles. And in the age to come, which is to say when the messianic age is fully realized, zoe aeonion, eternal life, or the life that God intended all along in this world and in the next world. Um, so not about a heavenly reward, but about the reward now that God wanted people to have when they have left behind the old way and embraced the way of Jesus. 
So uh, children is mentioned too many times in here and usually positively around be like little children. So I didn't want to, didn't highlight all those. Brothers and sisters is interesting here. Brothers is also many times and often generically. But the only sisters we've seen are specifically Mary and Martha. And if we were to apply this here, we would say Mary, who we are told had the better part, should quote unquote hate Martha. And again, I'm putting it in quotes until we hear what the word hate means. Because Martha is trying to get her to leave behind sitting at Jesus' feet to anxiously participate in the in the hospitality tasks uh, so uh, and yes here uh, et et only here uh, and one other place in the entire Bible really emphasizing this and even Pasuke itself and we really need to hear that before we can go back to hate so Pasuke which is sometimes sadly and unfortunately translated as soul and I've color-coded these so the blue ones are soul and the green ones are life and really it means life um, it does not mean soul at least not in the Bible it does it means soul when spoken by a Greek philosopher who has a whole different anthropology than Jesus had which is to say that this um, that Pesuke in the Hebrew Bible translates nephesh which is the element of being alive that matter has when God's breath is in it and not it's not limited to humans but all living things have nephesh which is to say the breath of life so as opposed to something immaterial altogether that transcends bodily life this is the very essence of God's life in one and so it should be translated life uh, or my being every time and that's what I wanted to highlight here the soul is always just flat wrong um, and we can see the context of that here um, so the issues in our immediate passage is about saving life or destroying it and we see that repeatedly notice that we hear both sides of it. Jesus challenges about saving life or destroying it on the Sabbath but he also says to people if you try to save your life you'll lose it and those who lose their life for my sake will save it uh, and that's part of the element here and we'll see that repeated in chapter 17 almost verbatim down there and here again sadly translated souls by your endurance who pomene translated as endurance but really meaning faithful resistance you will gain your lives not your souls but your lives so what is with this tension between Jesus trying to save life not not destroy it but if you try to save your own life you'll lose it it has to do with what he means by pasuke and both in our section here and the sections where he's um, talking about it here and in here he and the context shows that I can't show it here you can go back and see my video on 924 to see it there and we get to 1733 you can see it there maybe I've already done it by the time you're watching this one um, we'll see in the context of what he's referring to is your life in the Roman world and the clarity that follows by pairing this with the cross as we see in the very next verse um, so what do we mean by hate? So we have to go back and, and um, see that we saw that here. In this context, what it plainly means is not an emotion that is at the extent of a, a, a spectrum where neutrality is in the middle and something sentimental like love is at the other end. Agape at one end and missio at the other end have to do with absolute loyalty or absolute disloyalty in the sense of an absolute commitment to somebody or a group or an absolute rejection of a person or a group. That can certainly by, be accompanied by emotion. There's no question that if one chooses to reject or is told to reject somebody, that may well come with an anger or some other bad feeling. And if people are, tr are told to be with people, they may well develop affection for them and learn to love them um, in, the, in the way we think of love as being either erotically drawn to or just emotionally connected with. But that's not the root of what's at issue. The root of the issue, as we hear in the question of God and wealth, is not emotion um, but choice. One would not likely have emotion about money, which is, after all, not even a real thing, but an abstraction. I realize that some people might say the other way around, that money is real and God's the abstraction. But if you believe that, you probably wouldn't be watching these videos. Um, so the issue is completely rejecting the potter familias. And for this is one of many images one might see of the father in the Roman world. But I picked this one because what it shows him doing is offering incense and leading household prayer. Um, so the, in the Roman ideology and really the entire social structure, the pater familias, the man of the family, is a small representative of what the emperor is to the nation, what Zeus or Jupiter is um, to the cosmos, which is to say the one with unlimited power that you must obey or your life 
life will be chaos. Uh, and so it's so radically different than what we might imagine, certainly I growing up uh, in middle class United States in the 50s and 60s was told you can do whatever you want when you grow up and we'll be proud of you. But in the Roman world, if you did anything other than follow in your father's steps, footsteps, more importantly than your being uh, dishonored, would be your father being dishonored. And we'll see that played out in a strange way in the next chapter with what's usually called the story of the prodigal son, but I like to call the story of the dysfunctional family, where the father embraces the son who's gone off and destroyed the whole family reputation. Um, so it's a radical rejection of the Roman family and the entire way of life. And it would be no surprise that if you chose to invite the poor um, to your banquets, uh, certainly your family would not be happy with you. And so you have to choose to reject them altogether if they won't allow you to embrace the way of Jesus. And that's the essence of the cross here. We've only seen cross one other time in Luke's gospel, and that was back just before the journey to Jerusalem began. And he said to the crowd here, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And right after that is this verse that we just looked at, and it follows with the same kind of thing. What does it profit if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit their very selves? Which is to say, picking up your cross daily is saying each day when I get up, I'm as if I'm dead to the Roman world, as if the Roman world wants to execute me. That's how I see myself when I go out there into the world. I don't care what the Roman people think of me, even my own family, because I'm absolutely dedicated to following Jesus. So next time we'll see the, the first couple of examples that Jesus gives of people who did not engage in bad and good planning and what that might mean for a Roman audience. See you for that next time. Bye-bye.